Hello everyone and welcome to this first Rylem Rock and Talk in 2024. I'm Hans Boyshausen from the University of Cape Town in South Africa and I will talk about concrete patch repairs, so simple and yet so difficult. In particular, we'll talk about what constitutes high performance concrete patch repairs and what does it even mean to have high performance concrete patches and what are the misconceptions and myths around suitable repair materials. The presentation will cover factors that affect the performance of patch repairs, a little bit on codes and standards, what is required and what is specified, what is the effect of high strength and how does high strength, which is often perceived as a high performance indicator, affect the actual performance of concrete patch repairs. We talk about structural concrete patch repairs. What is a structural repair? How can you do it? And does a repair mortar actually ever really contribute to the structural load bearing capacity of a structure? What do we really want from patch repairs? And what are the misunderstandings around the selection of materials? And how can we do it? Looking at the purpose of patch repairs, Typically, localized patch repair on damaged concrete is applied for a number of reasons. It could be due to aesthetic reasons, it could be to reinstate the lost concrete section due to damage or deterioration, or it could be to reinstate the concrete section and steel after reinforcement corrosion has taken place. And overall, it's around the aesthetics of the structure, the structural capacity of the structure, and also the durability. Yeah, and that's how it looks like. For example, one of the most important cases where patch repair is applied is that where we repair reinforcement corrosion damage, which is typically due to carbonation or um, chloride ingress. In those cases, you want to dig out the contaminated concrete around the steel, clean the steel and reinstate the cross section in simple terms. And this is how it can be done. So patches should have straight corners which are neatly cut, after which the concrete can be removed. If you expose the steel, you need to clean all the rust of the steel and make sure the steel is free of any corrosion products. Here an example of how it should look like. So the concrete has been removed, the corners have been cut straight, the steel has been cleaned and subsequently the steel was coated with a protective coating to minimize the risk of future corrosion. Another example of a good patch repair where things have been done right. In terms of concrete surface preparation, one does not need to provide a very rough surface typically a surface roughness of around two, three or four millimeters is sufficient to give you good bond between the substrate and the repair mortar. And once you have prepared your substrate accordingly, you can apply the patch repair mortar, which is often a proprietary repair mortar that you buy from industry suppliers. You can also mix your own concrete overlay or patch repair mortars. It needs to be cured and Following curing, often these mortars receive a surface coating to provide further protection, to provide further curing and to provide a certain um, continuous aesthetic appeal to the structure. Now this process of patch repair is relatively simple, but the problem is that the performance of patch repairs is typically quite bad. Here an example from literature where um, Michael Grantham and Al investigated the performance of patch repairs in service. And as you can see here, most patch repairs fail after a period of about 10 years. So even though this is a very simple process, there are factors that affect the performance of patch repairs and if they do not perform as intended, then you've wasted your money, you've wasted your time and you possibly have not achieved any additional durability on the structure. The causes of failure typically are incorrect damage assessment and design of the repair, the selection of materials and the application and workmanship. And as a consequence, you get 
cracking of the petrol pair, you get delamination, debonding, spalling of the petrol pair and continuous rebar corrosion inside the patch or surrounding the patch. Some, of, some examples of how it can go wrong. Here we investigated a, um, a jetty on the west coast in South Africa where a large-scale shock crate repair had been applied which was debonding. When we looked at this in more detail, you could see the shock crate, very dense, high quality, good material applied to a smooth, unprepared concrete substrate surface. And on smooth, unprepared surfaces, it is very difficult to achieve bond even with very good materials. So surface preparation clearly is very important. Also very important is to make sure that the steel is properly prepared. You need to undercut the steel, clean the steel, of all rust and then coat it with a protective coating and then reinstate the section, simply painting or yeah, painting the surface of the corroded reinforcement or applying a mortar straight onto the corroded steel surface does not help. <laughs> That's my favorite example of pet repair gone wrong. I guess these guys, they just left for lunch or they didn't have enough material left over, no preparation no um, proper application and something like this clearly will not work. More commonly, however, even if pet repairs are done properly, a problem is that of cracking. Most pet repairs crack quite early after implementation. And if pet repairs crack, they will affect the performance because this allows ingress of deleterious substances to the steel and also cracks act as a boundary where delamination and debonding can be initiated. So the performance requirements for pet repairs, what do we want out of a pet repair? The pet repair must stick to the substrate, so we need sufficient bond strength. The bond strength is mostly affected by workmanship and the substrate surface conditions, but it's also affected by cracking. As mentioned, cracking creates boundary conditions from which delaminations occur. We also want sufficient durability. That means we need to minimize the penetrability of the patch to an extent where it protects the underlying or the embedded steel reinforcement. We want to minimize or prevent cracking because cracking, of course, opens up a pathway for substances to get to the steel and potentially continue reinforcement corrosion. And we want to prevent reinforcement corrosion inside the patch and in the surrounding concrete. And this presentation will focus on the issue of cracking, because cracking is one of the main factors that influences these performance criteria. And there's a common misconception that as long as the strength of the patch is good and the shrinkage is low, cracking can be prevented. But that is not the case, as we will show in this presentation. Now, in terms of shrinkage, those pet repair mortars usually have very high shrinkage strains simply because they don't contain coarse aggregates. They often have a high cement content and a high water content. The tensile stresses that come out of the restrained shrinkage depend on a number of factors. The characteristics of the restraint, the properties of the material, in particular the shrinkage, the elastic modulus, the creep or relaxation, and the tensile strength in all of this is often not sufficient to prevent the cracking. And here you see a simplified illustration of how stresses develop inside a pet repair. The stress is simply the function of the restraint strain times the elastic modulus according to Hooke's law. And the moment the tensile stresses exceed the tensile strength, cracking occurs. And in the equation, you see that the stress is a function of the creep. The creep relaxation lowers the stresses in the repair mortar. It depends on the degree of restraint. It depends on the amount of free shrinkage the patch repair um, tries or intends to undergo. And it depends on the elastic modulus. And now coming back to this misconception that we need to have high strength in pet repair mortars to improve the performance. Looking at the effects of a high cement content which you need for high strength in pet repairs, high cement contents increase 
early cracking due to hydration heat development. Many of these mortars are 40, 50, 60 MPa strong. Lots of heat is developed in those mortars in typically quite thin patches, which can lead to quite substantial thermal cracking, which adds to the long-term cracking due to shrinkage. High cement contents, of course, are also not sustainable. And also these repair mortars containing high cement contents are very costly. Comparing the price of mixed repair mortar per cubic meter to the normal price of ready mixed concrete, you will find that those mortars are about 20 to 30 times more expensive than conventional concrete. Looking at the risk of cracking, the previous slide showed you the stresses. Now, once the stresses exceed the strength, cracking occurs. So, looking at the effects of high strength, of course, a high strength of the mortar gives you a higher crack resistance. That is good. That is one good factor. But also, a high strength is related to a high elastic modulus. A high elastic modulus is bad because it increases the stresses. A high strength is also related to low creep and relaxation, which also is bad. So you have one good factor and two bad factors. Uh, the shrinkage, which is of course also important to determine the risk of cracking, is not much affected by the strength. So the question now is, what is the overall effect of increasing the strength or of having a high strength in your patch repair motor? And in this regard, we've had many research projects looking at the influence of mixed design parameters and other conditions on the cracking of patch repair motors. Here you see Dr. Philemon Arito from the University of Namibia, who has looked into the influence of mixed design parameters on restrained shrinkage cracking in cementitious mortars. And he produced up to about 40 different mortars, different mixed compositions, water binder ratios, with and without admixtures, fibers, um, internal curing aids, and so on. And he investigated, or part of his study was to investigate the cracking performance using the, res the restraint ring test, where you cast a ring of mortar or concrete around the steel ring, and on removal of the formwork, you start to monitor the mortar for the time of cracking. And the earlier a mortar cracks, the um, worse its performance will be in the, in the field. So this test in particular gives you a comparative analysis of the susceptibility of cracking of different mortars. And if we use this research and we put all the test results on a single graph and we compare the compressive strength versus the age of cracking, then you can see here that as the compressive strength increases, the age at cracking of those mortars decreases, meaning that a lower strength mortar has got a higher crack resistance. And that is quite consistent across all the research projects that we have done on this topic. An increase in compressive strength will lead to a decrease in cracking performance. And considering that compressive strength clearly um, leads to or high compressive strength clearly leads to higher risk of cracking, it needs to stop. We need to stop using high strength as a performance indicator for concrete patch repairs. Now to minimize shrinkage cracking in patch repairs, we can look at the composition of the mortar, the mechanical properties, and also at curing methods. In one project, we investigated the effect of coarse aggregates content and the size of coarse aggregates on the cracking of patch repair mortars. Again, we used the ring test, but we also used um, proper overlays cast on the concrete slab in our laboratory for the investigation. And to summarize the results, you can see here, as the aggregate volume content increases, the age of cracking increases, um, indicating a an increase in performance. Um, these test results, you can find them in literature, so I will not discuss in detail what has caused this increase in performance, but clearly to be, to be seen, putting aggregates, coarse aggregates into patch repair mortars has a drastic effect on the cracking performance. You can see we are comparing two different mortars here, one um, 
45 and 160, where 45 indicates a water binder ratio of 0.45 and the 60 indicates a water binder ratio of 0.6. Again, you can see how the higher water binder ratio, the lower strength, outperforms the higher strength one. Looking at the effect of the aggregate content on the crack area, which is simply um, the crack length times the average crack depth, uh, crack width, sorry, you can see um, again a drastic increase in performance as the aggregate content increases with much lower crack areas at higher aggregate contents. In another project, we looked at curing methods. And we looked at the typical curing that might be applied on site to concrete patch repairs. Air curing means there's no particular effort has been taken to cure the, the concrete, the patch after installation. We looked, we looked at uh, using plastic sheets for two days and plastic sheets for seven days. We used wet, wet cloth for two days or seven days. And also we used a protective coating and a curing compound applied to the patch one day after application. And we compared those different curing methods, again using the ring test. But again also we used overlays cast onto the slab of our concrete laboratory to see how the ring test corresponds to the performance of actual overlays. And here the test results, as expected, the non-cured samples, so the air-cured samples gave the least performance, the lowest performance. The methods where plastic sheets or wet cloths were applied for two days only also did not perform very well. Extending these to seven days was quite effective. And similarly, the uh, permanent curing methods, so the protective curing um, compound and the protective coating were quite effective in improving the crack resistance. And more significantly, if we look at the effect of those permanent methods on the crack area, we see a drastic improvement with much smaller crack areas when we have these permanently applied curing methods on the surface, which is simply the result of them preventing shrinkage and therefore ongoing crack opening. It is also interesting to compare the crack area to the age of cracking. And in principle, what you can see here is that a repair mortar that cracks earlier will also have a larger crack area. So we can extend the time of cracking. And it's to be noted that it is very difficult to altogether prevent cracking and pet repair mortars. We have to accept that they will probably crack in practice. We can only minimize it. And a repair mortar that cracks later due to good curing typically also has lower crack areas, which of course links to improved performance. In summary, minimizing cracking and patch repairs, how we can do it. We can increase the coarse aggregate content, which has a huge effect on the performance. We can also increase the coarse aggregate size, which has a drastic effect due to crack mechanics. We didn't cover this in detail in this presentation, but you will find all this in the literature. Increasing curing durations, of course, increases crack resistance, and in particular, protective coatings and curing compounds significantly decrease cracking and also crack areas. And largely, low strength is good. We don't need to have high strength in our repair mortars. But you might ask the question, what about structural repairs? What if a pet repair has to contribute, contribute to the structural behavior of the structure? Can we really accept low strength? Or what are the consequences of a low strength mortar in comparison to a high strength mortar when it comes to the structural contribution of the pet repair? And this we have investigated in another project. Structural concrete patch repair. Is it possible to have structural repairs? Is it truth or is it a myth? Looking again at the patch repair process, on the left you have your corroding steel, the 
contaminated concrete is then removed, the steel is cleaned, the pet repair is reinstated. And the question is, does this pet repair now contribute to the structural behavior of the structure? If the loads are not removed from the element, then the moment the concrete, the deteriorated concrete, the contaminated concrete is removed, the loads will flow around this hole essentially. If the patch is then reinstated, the load will not go back into that patch because it does, the, the load doesn't even know that the member has been repaired. So in order to introduce any stresses into the patch repair mortar, the loads must be first removed from the member. So the beam or the wall or the um, column needs to be propped. And once the load is removed, the patch can be reinstated and then on reloading that element, the stresses will be introduced to the member, which is also, of course, why the codes and standards specify that for structural repair, the loads must be removed before the repair is undertaken. In terms of the codes and specifications, the European standard specifies quite arbitrary limits for the strength of structural repair motors, where the North American code requires input from the structural um, designer in terms of choosing a material that will structurally contribute to the load-bearing resistance of the structure. But in all these codes, there is the underlying assumption that the patch repair mortar will contribute to the structural capacity of the structure if done correctly. We investigated the structural contribution of a structural patch repair mortar to the load bearing resistance of a member. We looked at three different mortars, um, proprietary repair mortars, commercial repair mortars from industry, all of very high strength and all perceived to have very high quality. We measured the compressive strength of those mortars at different ages. You can see all of them have compressive strengths exceeding 70 MPA at 28 days, so clearly high strength, perceived high performance mortars. The elastic modulus was around um, 30 to 35 gigapascals at 28 days, which according to the standards also would um, signify a structural repair mortar that meets the requirements. The shrinkage strain in these mortars was quite low, which is largely all to the use of shrinkage compensating admixtures in these materials. We measured the specific creep after one day of loading and seven days of loading, because these were input parameters that we needed for the modeling of long-term stresses in the patch repair. The modeling was done um, on the assumption that we have a column 500 by 500 millimeters with a 100 millimeter deep concrete patch repair across the whole width of the column. The model assumptions are summarized here. It was a short column under axial compression, no load eccentricity, no bending. We had strain compatibility in the section, meaning the strain in the overlay and substrate was always equal. The strain in the substrate was the result of the load applied, whereas the uh, strain in the repair mortar was a, is a combination of the um, strain from the applied load, but also the creep and the shrinkage in the repair mortar. We modeled monolithic behavior without any debonding or cracking at the interface. And you can also see the parameters we assumed for the substrate concrete here. And we modeled this to find out what is the long-term stress contribution in the repair mortar. You can see at day zero, at the time of loading the section, due to an elastic modulus which is equal in the repair mortar and the substrate in our modeling, they take the same amount of stress. And then with time, the stress in the repair motor goes down and down. And at the same time, of course, the stress in the substrate goes up, as now the substrate has to take over the stress that the repair motor no longer can take. And looking at what causes this diminishing stress in the repair motor, you can see that the main effect um, is that of creep. So in the bottom graph, you can see the different strain components in the patch repair motors um, 
depending on the time of loading. And with or as the time goes on, the creep in the repair motor um, gets more and more and more. And as the repair motor creeps, it sheds it lo it, its load to the substrate. Another strain component that leads to or that contributes to this effect is that of shrinkage in the repair motor. We also looked at the effect of bulking the motor with coarse aggregates. And while improving the performance with the addition of coarse aggregates is positive, in all our model simulations, the loads was removed from the repair motor over time. So after a duration of two or three months, in all our simulations, the patch repair motor had essentially lost its structural contribution due to creep and shrinkage. So in summary of what was presented, Cracking in cementitious repair motors is very important because cracking largely affects the performance of these motors when it comes to durability and debonding, protection of the steel and so on. Cracking can be minimized by minimizing the coarse aggregate, uh, sorry, by maximizing the coarse aggregate contents and by increasing the maximum aggregate size. Curing has a very good effect. If you have extended curing, the performance will be better. In particular, surface sealing methods such as protective coatings and curing compounds are quite effective in improving the crack resistance or the crack behavior. We need to minimize the compressive strength. Compressive strength is not a performance indicator for patch repairs. We don't need that strength and higher strength gives us worse performance. Also, it's a total waste of money and it's not sustainable. We need to reduce the binder content. In all our investigations, the ring test was really a very good method to assess the um, influence of mixed parameters and construction procedures on cracking. So good method, easy to use, and gives a good comparison between different input parameters. High strength is in practice still considered a measure of high quality for repair materials. However, as I, I think pointed out enough now, high strength means poorer performance. We need to move away as engineers, but also as researchers to associate high strength and concrete with high quality. We need strength for structural capacity of reinforced concrete members, but we don't need to use it as a quality indicator for anything else. And I think this research, which focuses on pet repairs, also shows that. It's very difficult to introduce any stress into a patch repair. And even if you manage to do that over time, that stress will most likely be lost completely due to creep, but also other effects such as shrinkage. What we need to focus on developing in practice are low strength repair motors with adequate performance, um, uh, performance characteristics, such as good bond strength, good crack resistance, and suitable electrochemical properties to minimize reinforcement corrosion. We do not need high strength patch repair motors. Let's save cement and cost and at the same time give these motors a better performance. And looking at the um, increasing need to repair infrastructure, civil infrastructure, urban infrastructure across the world, I think it's time that we look at the performance of these motors to make sure we can extend the service life of the structures properly and not waste money and um, install poor performance at the same time. Before I close, I'd like to do some marketing for our conference, the seventh international conference on concrete repair, rehab and retrofitting, which will again take, in pla uh, take place in Cape Town this year in November. You are welcome to still submit your abstracts, but please do that as soon as possible. Of course, this is an event that you do not want to miss. Thank you for your attention.